Robbie Williams Rewind. Welcome to Robbie Williams Rewind. We are the champions. I'm Matt. And I'm Lucy. And along with help from special guest fans, we take you on an in-depth rewind through the solo career of multi-award winning singer, songwriter and entertainer, Robbie Williams. Today we're talking about Robbie's third album, Sing When You're Winning. We'll talk about the tours in the next episode. And today we have our very special guest, American Paul. Hello, Paul. Hey, Paul. Hello. Paul lives in the northeastern state of New York in America, where he works as a TV producer. And he's also the winner of two Emmy Awards for documentaries he's produced. Wow. So we are very lucky to have him, I would say. (laughs) Um, In his free time, American Paul loves to explore European cities near where Robbie is performing. I'd just like to know, am I the first male who is a guest on your podcast? Yeah, you are. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely you are. First male, first American. Yeah, first first overseas guest. I am so appreciative for this chance. Thank you so much. That's okay. (laughs) Absolutely. We, We are as well. The feeling's very mutual, Paul. I mean, obviously, as the episodes go go on, we'll try and represent more males and people from other countries as well. So we do want to have a global feeling on the podcast. Yeah. But it's nice to have you as the first, Paul. (laughs) I feel so honoured to be on your podcast and so excited to have the opportunity to speak about the album Sing When You're Winning, because my fandom of Robbie Williams begins with that album. You know, when I tell people where I live in the state of New York, that I'm a big fan of Robbie Williams, I usually have to explain who he is. Sometimes the person mishears me and thinks that I'm saying Robin Williams, the late actor. Then I correct them and say who Robbie is. So tell us how you discovered Robbie then. How I learned about Robbie. We have to go back to the late 1990s. I was living in the middle of the USA and working in the states of Iowa and Illinois, Now, I would have recognized the Take That song back for good on the radio because it got radio play in the U.S., but I didn't know the group's name, and I paid no attention to that song. And one day, it must have been in 1998, I was surfing the internet, and I was on a Pet Shop Boys fan site. I love the Pet Shop Boys. Yeah, Yeah, they're great. There was some online talk about a song Neil Tennant was singing with someone named Robbie Williams, and that was the first time I'd read or noticed the name Robbie Williams. Then we fast forward a bit to the spring of 1999. I'm at home watching a music video channel, and the video for Millennium comes on Ooh. on TV in the USA. For context, yes, Robbie was being promoted yep. for a while in the USA. And I remember thinking, oh, this is that guy Neil Tennant worked with. He looks really sophisticated and dapper in that tux. <laughs> I had turned it on toward the end of the video, and then Robbie is shown in a speedboat at the end with an open shirt. And I thought, okay, he's got a sexy image too. And Lucy, I know you like that scene because you'd said you liked how they showed the artifice of the movie playing behind Robbie. (laughs) Makes me laugh. Then I pretty much forgot about it. I would occasionally hear Millennium on the radio. Didn't really love the song, but I definitely knew it was this guy, Robbie Williams, singing. Now we fast forward to August of 2000. I was in a gay club in a small city in Iowa, There were video monitors playing music videos, and the music was loud in the club. It wasn't a dance club, just a bar, really. And then it happens. The video for Rock DJ appears on a large monitor, and I see the name Robbie Williams appear in the corner of the screen. And I was mildly curious. I thought, okay, now I can see what this guy Robbie Williams is up to. I like the beat of the song. In the video, Robbie is dancing to get the attention from the DJ in the club, and these women are roller skating around (laughs) in a circle, but they're taking no notice of him. So an ignored Robbie (laughs) then removes his shirt. And I thought, oh, (laughs) that sexy image he has, he's taking it a bit further now. And I'm not looking away. I'm watching the video, and Robbie removes his trousers and is dancing in his black underwear. Tiger pants. (laughs) The tiger pants. (laughs) Okay, Robbie Williams has my undivided attention. Robbie removes the underwear in the video. Now, our American stars aren't shown quite so naked in music videos. Then to get the DJ's attention, he peels off his skin and removes parts of himself until he's just a skeleton. Yes, it's a graphic video, but I was more taken with the nudity than with the gory elements. 
And I remember nothing else about that <laughs> night. I remember only the rock DJ video. What turned me into a person who would actually purchase a Robbie Williams item was very clever marketing in the USA. A day or two later, I'm in a shop that sells CDs. There are a lot of copies of the Sing When You're Winning CD. And on it was a red sticker that said, Features the Rock DJ Video. Ah. It was a video you could play on your computer in a little box. And I thought, okay, I'll give this CD a chance. I rarely bought a whole album of an artist whose songs I hardly knew. But I thought, how interesting to have that video in addition to the song I had enjoyed. Plus, there are five Robbies on the cover. <laughs> He's holding himself up, winning a football or a soccer trophy. All five of those Robbies are handsome. So, yeah, I bought the CD. I put the CD in my car CD player. It's a sunny summer day, very positive time in my life. And I'm driving around listening to these new sounds, these wonderful lyrics and Robbie's voice. And within four songs, I'm absolutely loving this CD. And within a month, Robbie Williams is my favorite recording artist. Wow. Huh. Now, the Pet Shop Boys are British, which I love. They're intelligent and talented. And Robbie's all that, too. Plus, he's selling sex. <laughs> yes. The way he raps on Rock DJ, yeah. he's like a young Pet Shop Boys, but with sex, youth and sex appeal. He eclipsed all other artists and became my favorite at the end of the summer of 2000. But yeah, it started for me with that rock DJ video in that club in Iowa with the music blaring. It was that night, that video, that song, that moment in music when Robbie Williams first got my undivided attention. Wow. Amazing. Now, just to put this into context, when rock DJ came out in England, many people knew it was the launch of Robbie's third solo album and that he'd been a singer with a boy band and... You guys in England, you had all this history that people knew about. And when I heard the Sing When You're Winning album, I knew nothing about Rob's story. Nothing about his time with Take That, nothing about his struggles with addiction. For me, it was all about the music and the visual appeal at first. And I just loved the music. So from a marketing standpoint, somehow it's like that Rock DJ video and the Sing When You're Winning album were marketed right to me. I was the target audience. Yeah. Yeah. They were trying to increase Robbie's visibility in America. His nudity-filled video was playing in a gay bar. I was already prone to like British music. I felt like that video and the CD containing the video were marketed right to me. So their marketing strategy worked on me. Yeah. Definitely. What a story. That summer of 2000, though, I will never forget the high level of excitement I had to discover a new artist for me to listen to. And Robbie has managed to, to bring me up to that level of excitement Many, many times since. Wow. <laughs> wow. What an incredible story and what a, what a really powerful first connection yeah. uh, to him and his music. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Paul. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> it's my pleasure. <laughs> so um, from that, can you explain what Robbie means to you? Wow. Um, Robbie Williams means a lot to me. Um, he not only makes the best pop music in the world, but he is also a good person at heart. Mr. Williams is an intelligent songwriter. I never feel ridiculous when enjoying his songs. Yeah. I appreciate his vocals, his melodies, the chorus. He's the best live entertainer I've ever seen. But beyond the talent, Robbie Williams has a beautiful soul, I think. Rob may not think so all the time, but I think he is, at his core, a good person. He's not a bully. He's not a thug. He's not a snob, despite all the millions he makes. He's inclusive. He doesn't dismiss people because of their race or religion or sexual orientation. I've seen him stick up for a fan who is being bullied by another fan on his website. He's forgiving. I hope we'll talk a little bit more about that later in this podcast. Rob is compassionate. Uh, he once asked people to show compassion for a young boy he'd heard about who was ridiculed for believing in aliens. He's generous with his fans in terms of the time and attention he's given us. I find him a gentle and sweet person. Now, now not always, because he's dealing with the enormous pressures of fame and everyone wanting his attention. But I think he's a very special, genuinely good human being deep down. Yeah. He's also very smart. He knows yeah, how to make definitely. an audience laugh with his own spontaneous thoughts. And thinking fast on your feet takes an enormous amount of intelligence. 
Uh, one thing I, I also like about him is he's very concerned mm -hmm. that his children have good manners, and that's a sign of a, a good person. See, I think there are some people out there who are jerks, who are bigots, and who are selfish. And there are people in positions of power who want to make the world an oppressive, terrible place for most people. And then there are good people whose daily work makes the world a better place. And Rob is a person who sets an example with kindness, creativity, and an inclusive attitude that help make the world a better place. I wrote a fan message right to Rob on the Robbie Williams site in November of 2012. I wrote, the world is better off with Robbie Williams in it, and my musical landscape would be pretty sparse right now if you weren't creating music. Wow. Strong words. And I would agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you have a favorite Robbie song or album? Well, Sing When You're Winning is one of my favorite albums. Um, so is Reality Killed the Video Star, but uh, a song that just blows me away is the one he did with Gary Barlow called Shame. Oh, yeah. This came out 10 years to the month that uh, after I'd become a Robbie Williams fan, and it was in August of 2010, I'd never paid any attention to Take That or Gary Barlow before this song because mm -hmm. I'd basically been following Robbie's lead. He was ignoring Gary Barlow, so I didn't see any reason to pay attention to him. Then Shame comes out. The two make up from their feud in the music video and in the song. And I'll tell you what, this is the moment in the history of pop music that moves me the most. Here are these two men. They had a feud for about 15 years. Then they made up. Then they made music about the feud and about making up. It takes an incredible amount of maturity to say you're sorry to someone after feuding for more than 10 years. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I've had a few friends in my life with whom I fought... And it was simply the end of the friendship. There was no chance yeah. given to say we're sorry. The yeah. lyrics, people spend a lifetime that way. What a shame. I relate to that. Some of my former friends will spend their lives without attempting to figure out where our friendship went wrong. And ultimately, we may be missing out on a potentially very nice experience as friends later in life. So I have incredible yeah. respect for anyone who can make up with a friend after so many years of not speaking. Also, they wrote that song, Shame, about the end of their feud. I'm not sure whether that's been done before in the history of music, whether two yeah. fighting members of a band write a song about making up from the fight and the part where they've made up is real. Do you know of any example of that? No. <laughs> no, I think you're right. Definitely. Never. I can't, cannot. And to do it under such scrutiny from everyone yeah. watching and listening... You know, to do it in the public eye is a very brave thing as well to do, I think. Right. Well, that song, Shame, it represents the moment in music that moves me the most. Yeah. Right. Rob and Gary apologized like the grown men they'd become, and they really listened to each other, and they got to understand why there'd been such a feud and how the other person was feeling. I really wish I had witnessed that moment between Rob and Gary. And the result yeah. of the apologies was more music. And the eventual incredible reunion of Take That. Yeah. Yeah, which was just, well, as you say, incredible. Yeah, as soon as I heard The Flood and saw the YouTube clips of them singing it on various shows, I was fully on board with Take That. And I'd been resisting Take That for years and years and years. <laughs> I was fully on board and so glad to book tickets for two shows of the Progress Tour. Oh, wow. That's more than you went to, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that on that tour, yeah. Yeah, That's, that is because our daughter was six months old, so he, he babysat and I went three times. <laughs> oh, they're just, well, like Robbie, they're showmen, aren't they? They, they? they just give the most incredible performance. They always give it their all. It's just a good show to go and see and just great, great singers as yeah. well, songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. So when was the first time you actually saw Robbie live? My first Robbie show was in the summer of 2003. 2003? Yes. Ah. During the Weekends of Mass Distraction tour to promote the album Escapology. And this was that tour that gave us the Live at Nebworth program. But I chose to see Robbie in Munich, Germany at the Olympic oh. Stadium. I flew over to Europe. I had not been back there since high school when I was an exchange student in France. Right. I had never been to Germany. I scoped out the Olympic Stadium the day before the show, and I queued very early the next morning. The set for that show was amazing, 
It had these large sections of video walls that could move around the stage. And as you know, for the entrance of Robbie, the walls parted and Robbie was hanging upside down in this yeah. daring escapology pose. And when I witnessed Robbie sing Angels for the first time in Munich, Germany, in that historic stadium, I remember thinking that I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world. Wow. <laughs> Did you come? You went on your own then. I did. I went on my own. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I had. Uh, let me think. I was going to meet up with someone in Rome, Italy. A friend of mine was coming over from America, so I combined the trip to Munich, Germany, with a trip to Italy, and that's been my pattern: is I will find a country or a place where I want to visit when Robbie's yeah. touring, and I will choose which shows to see based on where I want to tour. Uh, I actually do literary tourism and movie tourism where I go to sites that I have read about in books or seen in films or some p countries or places where I have an emotional connection to them. Yeah, I do have a fun related story um, about that exact thing because I'd read the Olympic Stadium in Munich was near the site of the factory location where they shot exteriors for Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, that early 1970s film. Oh. And... <laughs> the day that uh, I scoped out the stadium before the Robbie show, I stood high on a hill on the property and I managed to spot the clock tower, the tower that was unmistakably the one from Wonka's factory in the movie. So I walked down the hill in the direction of the tower. I made a straight line, walked past Robbie's tour buses. I lost sight of the tower, but still walked in a straight line because I knew where that tower was supposed to be. I crossed an insanely busy German freeway. Oh, my God. <laughs> Still walking in a straight line. This is a freeway I never should be crossing, but I was <laughs> I was walking in a straight line, and I, I eventually found the site of Willy Wonka's factory. It was the gas works in Munich, and even though a lot of the exterior had changed completely, I still felt the magic of that location looking at that beautiful clock tower. Robbie happens to like the song The Candyman from that movie, because he's played it before his live shows on the Take the Crown tour. Yeah, that's right. It was, wasn't it? Before he came on stage. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was. Yeah. yeah. Candyman. Yeah. yeah. He was tying it in with the song Candy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he also likes Sammy Davis Jr., who made that song a hit in the U.S. Right. So how many times have you seen him all together then? I have seen Rob perform live 13 times between 2003 mm -hmm. and 2019. I've seen Robbie on six tours, including the Take That Progress Live, plus Take the Crown show at the O2 in London and the Las Vegas residency. Oh, so you did go to Vegas then? Well, absolutely. Uh, since I had missed out on Robbie's early American concerts in 1999, I viewed the Vegas shows as something historical. Yeah. yeah. Like all American fans, I would like Robbie to tour the U.S., so I went to support my favorite pop star while he performed in a series of concerts in my country for the <laughs> first time in 20 years. So did you do have a meet and greet with him? Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, everyone told me that Robbie gives the best hugs, and that was absolutely true. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed the Vegas show very much. I love the yeah. opening song, Live in Las Vegas. Uh, I went to one show, and it was a very fun night, and I would definitely go see Robbie again in Vegas. And I'd be even more excited if he'd like to tour the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, there was a special energy in that show, in that theatre, in the win. It was, uh, yeah, something else, wasn't it? Yeah. Really? We'd never quite experienced the, the feeling and the vibe uh, that we felt there. And and I can concur on the big hugs. <laughs> <laughs> he he, uh, he grabbed us, didn't he, and yeah. gave us such a big hug. Yeah, he's a, he's a hugger. <laughs> I'd like to know from you two, why... Did you want to come over to the United States to see Robbie when you have such easy access to him in yeah. England and um, the European countries that are around you? Do you want to go for that? Well, for me, you? I've always wanted to go to Vegas. So I've spent a lot of time in America, but I had never been to Vegas. And so when Robbie announced that he was playing there, it gave us the perfect excuse yeah. to finally go, really. And because it was the meet and greet tickets as well, that was something you can't buy in Europe. So we thought, well, we might as well make the most of it and just have a trip of a lifetime. Yeah. 
the way they designed the whole experience, if you had a meet and greet as well as you know, was just so special. Being there on holiday as well and yeah. doing the helicopter tour over the Grand Canyon and yeah. I jumped off the strat. <laughs> oh nice. <laughs> with with a bunch with a it was a controlled descent. I didn't just jump off the strat. But. <laughs> Uh, we did so much, so much fun, and we and we were there with uh, loads of other Robbie fans that we knew as well. Um, yeah, it was it was particularly special. Um, yeah, but yeah, we would have we wouldn't have missed that for the world. Yeah, I'm glad you had that nice experience. Oh. Yeah, yeah, two nights. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have a best memory or moment with Robbie? I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> I used to go under the name Paul USA on Robbie's website. I used to write posts to compliment something Rob had done or sung, or I'd just post my thoughts under the name Paul USA. And this was before I'd had any internet chats with Rob. And this was the 22nd of November, 2012. And Robbie was performing three special shows at the O2 Arena in London to promote his Take the Crown album. This was seven months before the big Take the Crown st- stadium tour. And I liked the idea of a special show, which I had not seen from him before. So I queued up all day long. And while I was waiting in the queue, I had made a sign out of poster board and I stuck letter stickers on it, big letters that said USA for Rob. I'd been (laughs) using that phrase USA for Rob when I signed my posts on his website. I'd sign them, Paul USA, USA Uh for Rob. Ah. Now, I had posters like that before at previous Robbie shows, just because I thought he might like to know that he had an American in the audience who'd traveled a long way to see his show. Nowadays, Rob is used to people traveling from all over the world to see his shows, as you just attested to when you went to Vegas, and and Robbie was well aware of all of the people from all over the world who came to see those shows. Yeah. At any rate, during the song Hot Fudge, I was in the front row next to the barrier, And Rob is prancing around the stage, and he comes near me, and I hold up the sign. He's seen my face before from my profile photo on his website, and even during the progress tour a year earlier. Anyway, I hold up the sign, USA for Rob, and I see the recognition in his eyes and that beautiful smile. Call me delusional. It felt like two friends recognizing each other. I think Rob loves it when he recognizes his website fans and the audience of his show yeah. because for him, he's looking out into a sea of unknown faces yeah. and he's able to often spot people he knows yeah. from his website or from other shows. And maybe for him, it is like seeing old friends again, someone in the audience with a beaming, friendly face he recognizes. So he kneels down and shakes my hand. Wow. A few songs later, he announces to the audience, I want to dedicate this next song to American Paul. Wow. So you hadn't even told him his name, your name, and he he clearly, he knew. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. It it was very, very special. He he asked, where's American Paul? (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, Robbie Williams' only fan in America is here. (laughs) Round of applause for American Paul. (laughs) (laughs) Can you imagine? I think we were there that night. Was that the Thursday night? Yes, it was Thursday. And I know it was Thursday because American Thanksgiving, that holiday, always falls on a Thursday. And I remember this was the night of American Thanksgiving. So every year now, I have this wonderful memory to be thankful for. (laughs) Yeah, we were there. Yeah, I remember hearing that. And obviously, I've got the CD of that show. And so I sometimes hear it back as well. Yes, they were recording live CDs, weren't they, on each night. So you're you're recorded for posterity. (laughs) I freaking loved those live CDs of the individual yeah. shows that you could get. And I was so sorry when they stopped because I was addicted yeah, to them. Yeah. <laughs> For every live show I saw, I would get the corresponding CD. Yeah. yeah. So Robbie told the audience he liked what I'd written about his song Different on his website. I'd written that he was an intelligent songwriter and that Different has a gorgeous melody and some lovely phrases that should take it to number one. I'd written... Thank you, Rob, for music that is inspiring and that doesn't make me feel dumb for listening to it. Your songs are simply the best. So my absolute favorite performer dedicated the song that night to me while at the same time giving me the name American Paul. And I still use that name on Rob's websites. 
I mean, really, what a generous guy to make a fan of his feel that special. Yeah. And he does so many wonderful things like that for his fans during the shows. So that was a magical night for me, for sure. Wow. And there is a follow-up. Okay. (laughs) During that brief trip to England, I did a little bit of tourism, like I said, of film locations, and I wanted to see where Rob had shot the candy video at the Spitalfields Market in London. So I met up with two friends from the website, meeting them in person for the first time, and we ate at the English restaurant that you see in the candy video. It's that red restaurant. And we walked all around these places where Rob had shot that video and even discovered locations that weren't all that obvious. And it helped that Vicky, one of the friends, she had some experience in location shooting because one of her friends was a professional film location person. Yeah. And the other friend with us that day was Silke from Germany, with whom I'd exchanged many messages on Rob's site. Well, a little more than a week later, I am back in America and I get this email from Silke and the title is... Somehow this arm looks familiar. Now, I open the email and she writes, is this you? And attached was a photo, a beautiful photo of Rob shaking someone's hand as he knelt on the stage. And it looked like a professionally shot photo. Um, You could not see much of the person whose hand he was shaking, just the arm, (laughs) a slightly hairy arm. Yeah, It's obviously not a female's arm and part of a sweater sleeve. And I could see in the photo, I could see the faces of the audience, faces I recognized as I had stood near them during the show. So I boosted the contrast of the photo and looked closely at that sweater. Now, I had a photo of my own taken that night of myself wearing a sweater and holding my USA for Rob sign. The sweater sleeve in the professional photo and the sweater sleeves in the photo I had of myself were identical. Wow, so it was your photo. Yeah. (laughs) I wrote Mm. Silka back, yes, this is my (laughs) art. (laughs) Silka then played detective, looked up the properties of the photo and found out exactly what time that photo was taken and who took it. A photographer named Simon Niblett, a man who takes many of Rob's photos. Now, to wrap up this story quickly, Simon was a lovely man when I emailed him. And that handshake photo wound up on the back cover of Robbie Williams' official 2014 calendar. Oh, did it? Ah. Yeah. yeah. Do you have that calendar? I do. I've still got it upstairs somewhere. I'll have to go okay. and dig that out. <laughs> Matt always tells me off for keeping all my old calendars, but I've still got them all. <laughs> no. <laughs> we find somewhere to store these things eventually. <laughs> we'll have to go and have a look at that. Yeah. Oh. So it's a sweet little story about a song dedication and a handshake and the christening of American Paul. Robbie Williams deserves big thanks for the sweet interactions he has with his many friends in the audience. Oh, certainly true. Wow. He does so know so many of the people at the front and just as well from his website. He does. Yeah. And you're right, Paul. He, yeah, he has just such a caring way about his fans. And uh, he's the consummate performer when you're on stage with all of the pressures of you know, putting on the performance, remembering the lyrics, you know, remembering the stage movements. Uh, there's a lot going on and, and obviously the adrenaline is pumping and to actually find the space to reach out and connect with you and others. I think it, I think it is something quite special and you don't always see that from, no. from major artists. Um, so I think it does. It really sets them apart. Yeah, it does. Wow. It's simply amazing. Yeah. And Matt, you were saying that There's all that adrenaline going and there's so much going on and all that pressure is on Rob. But I've heard him like months later in Internet chats when he'll he'll tell a fan where they were actually standing. Yeah. In the arena. We've had that as well. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He he remembers such small details. It's kind of weird. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Hi, I'm Robbie Williams, and you're listening to Robbie Williams Rewind with the Champions. So have you got a funny, any funny moments with Robbie? I have kind of an awkward moment Oh, wh- where I did something kind of nasty to Rob once. It was the second night I saw Robbie on the Swings Both Ways tour in Amsterdam, yeah. 2014. That was one fantastic show, by the way. One of my very favorite Robbie shows. I love the set 
the songs. I love the dancers. Rob had both female and male dancers, I think, for the first time. Yeah. So I'm in the front row the second night, and he sometimes likes to use audience members as part of the entertainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So (laughs) it's toward the end of the show, and he comes near me, and he says, Paul, which night do you think the audience were best, last night or tonight? (laughs) (laughs) I am a very literal person. Words mean a lot to me, and I'm processing Robbie Williams has just asked me a question during the show, (laughs) and my mind has to process this. In a fraction of a second, I remember thinking, well, the audience last night seemed louder to me, but if I tell them that, it might not go over well with the crowd that's surrounding me tonight. (laughs) So I had sure better say tonight. So I tell Rob, tonight. I mouth it, tonight. And Rob says to the audience, Yesterday? Don't don't say that. You said today, tonight. Paul says tonight. So again, I process this in a split second and I start to think, wouldn't it be funny if I gave Rob the finger? So I remembered the funny kind of mean expression my Aunt Patty had given a long time ago when she jokingly gave her husband the finger behind his back. And I repeated this for Rob. <laughs> Up went my middle finger in a humorous gesture, and Rob smiles and says, he really did say tonight. (laughs) And after that, in the show, he'd walk by me during Angels, and we'd give each other the thumbs up. And for the rest of the show, it was all smiles and winks and sweetness. And I completely forgot about the finger. And then the next day, I was going down an escalator. Now, I have no idea where this escalator was, but I remember I was on an escalator, and the thought just hit me like a question. Did I give Robbie Williams the finger? (laughs) What makes this a big deal is I never give anyone the finger. (laughs) Never. So Robbie Williams is one of the few people in the world to whom I have given this vulgar gesture. (laughs) I later went to an internet cafe and I wrote a message to Rob on his site. I wrote, Rob, your British humor at my expense met my American middle finger. (laughs) Yes, it was a joke. I raised that finger with love, Robbie Williams, only with love. Mostly it was thumbs up all night. Now, Vicky, the fan I'd met at Spitalfields Market, posted a response to my post. Shock and horror, American Paul. Look forward to that one going on next year's calendar. (laughs) (laughs) About 20 days after the finger incident, Rob is having an online chat with some of his fans. I am not in this chat. And a young woman named Thursa from Belgium, who's also become a friend of mine since we spent the day in the queue together in Amsterdam. Thursa asks a question. Rob, are you not shocked by what American Paul did to you in Amsterdam? (laughs) I love how she put that, what Paul did to you. (laughs) And Rob responded to her. Oh, say hey to Paul and tell him not to worry about giving me the finger. I deserved it, and it made me laugh. Aww. Very sweet. Very sweet. And then Thursa and Silka sent me Rob's response. So again, that's Rob being very generous to his fans, having a chat with them and making sure the fan who gave him the finger didn't feel bad about it. And at that point, my sister had heard the whole story from my mother, and she sends me an email. I heard you flipped off Robbie Williams. <laughs> So it's a silly story. It's about joking around. Bless Robbie Williams for making moments like that possible. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I, I have a feeling, Paul, that some Robbie cheekiness was rubbing off on you that night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Very much so. Yeah. Well, Great you might theory. be that cheeky. I don't know. I think, you know. <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a wonderful story. So um, if you could ask Rob one question or, or say one thing to him. What do you think that would be? I've been on some internet group chats with Rob, and sometimes the groups are really small, so the conversation really flows nicely. Uh, I just like talking to Rob like he's a regular guy. I've asked him a lot of questions. Um, In one of his homemade Instagram videos, he had a stuffed Paddington bear, and I have always adored stuffed Paddington bears. So I asked him, whose was it? And he said it was the kids. But he said that he was genuinely careful with the bear. He felt protective toward it. And I respected that he was careful with it. And 
four years after I'd given him the uh, the finger, four years later, Rob was having an internet chat, and the fan discussion had turned to vulgar gestures. See, sometimes I just like to make Rob laugh, or try to at least. I like to say something funny. And so when the conversation turned to vulgar gestures, I wrote, Rob, I accidentally gave someone the finger once. It was no big deal. <laughs> and Rob responded, I remember. <laughs> Easily done. <laughs> you know, we fans have internet chats about serious stuff too, like the afterlife and some terrifying political situations in my country. Yeah. On a day... Once when I needed to process the horror of what was going on in my country, I was on an internet chat with Rob, and he asked me if I were scared. So we had a chat about a very serious matter, and he always lifts my spirits, so I hope that we fans are able to do that for him as well. Yeah, definitely. I think so. I do think so. And actually, I remember he said that at the Under the Radar gig. Yeah. He absolutely said, you know. Yes, uh, some along the lines of it, it's it's nice to be liked and have fans and kind of helps my ego, but you help me more than more than oh, I help you. Something like that. <laughs> something That's very nice. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to think it's a mutual, it's a mutual thing. Yeah. So Paul has really basically asked Robbie every question under the sun that possible, <laughs> and and given him the finger. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're saying here. That's reasonably accurate. <laughs> Oh, what a lovely, what a lovely relationship to have, though, Paul. That's that's great. So, and and obviously that's formed over many years as well, isn't it? And 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 you've made friends with many other fans as well. And I think we were saying that. Um, uh, we were ta- I think I was talking about that on the first episode. It's so lovely to have the kind of family feeling, you know, the around the whole Robbie Land experience, and and Robbie to be a part of that as well. It's it's yeah, it's. It's quite unique, I would say. I love interacting with with Robbie's fans and the whole family thing, like you just said. I I remember once Thursa, the woman I told you about, we hadn't seen each other much in the queue one particular day in Paris for the heavy entertainment show. And I ran into the arena and I had staked out my spot at the end of a runway. And then all of a sudden I hear, Paul, come here. And Thursa is saving me a spot right front row center. So I get an upgrade thanks to Thursa. And so I just ran and filled that slot. It's like fans supporting one another. And then she and I enjoyed that show together that night. So I just love the whole family atmosphere. And really, I'm sorry that I have not met you two in person yet, because I think we would have a great time. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? We haven't met. Yes. Yeah. We've been in the same venue. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it will happen, Paul. Yeah. When all these crazy times are hopefully improved around the world, we will meet up. Yeah. That would be great. So while we've got you as an American with us, why do you think Robbie didn't make it big in America? Hmm. First of all, you might be asking the wrong person because I'm somewhat baffled by it. Mm. The marketing of Robbie Williams worked on me. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) But early on in my fandom, I began to realize that if I wanted to get the early British albums and some of his DVDs, I would have to order them online and get imports. You could tell there was a push to make Robbie big in the USA in the year 1999. EMI took his first two albums, cut the song number in half, and released a CD called The Ego Has Landed. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember Millennium getting radio play. I remember Angels getting some radio play. And The Ego Has Landed charted at 63 in the U.S. Yeah. That was certified gold, but still 63 hardly compares to Robbie's chart-topping success in Great Britain. Now, for Sing When You're Winning, I saw that rock DJ video in a bar one time, and I saw it on the enhanced CD that I bought, but I never saw it on television. Right. Now, let's compare that to Ricky Martin. Mm -hmm. I remember the night he became a star in my house. I was watching MTV, the video for Live in La Vida Loca comes on, and then it seems like it's on at least once every hour. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think you needed to tour the U.S. at that time. I think a lot of video play could take you very far. It was apparent on that one night that Ricky Martin was huge in the USA. Yeah. By the way, the video for Rock DJ did play a few times on MTV, and it won a Video Music Award in America for Best Special Effects in a video in 2001. But I'll tell you what, the promotion for Robbie stopped right then. 
I didn't hear a single song from Sing When You're Winning on the radio. Oh, oh right. Sad. Uh, that album charted in the U.S. at 110 on the U.S. Billboard Top 200 Albums. A journalist from Stereo Gum wrote about Robbie in the U.S. at the turn of the millennium. He wrote, Williams had built a good following in the gay community and among Anglophile pop fans. Now, I read that, and I love British music. And I think, wow, I hate to be a cliche or to follow a crowd. But actually, as I said, I felt that Robbie Williams was marketed right to me. But in the USA, I mostly felt alone in my fandom during those early months. I felt like I discovered a big secret, and I knew who the most amazing pop star in the world was, and no one around me did. So yeah, I'd play his music for friends and sing his praises. I do have one theory about why Rob in the USA didn't quite mesh. Americans had no history with Robbie Williams when he released his solo material. Americans did not know the story of Take That. We didn't have American girls crying when Robbie left Take That because they simply were not yeah. aware of Take That. They had one hit in the U.S., I believe. So Robbie's solo material in the U.K. carried a huge emotional weight and all this history behind it. I know that you two experienced that. Yeah, well, yeah, because I was a Take That fan. and So I kind of grew up with him, really. He was just always there. Yeah, and, and whilst I wasn't necessarily so fanatical around Take That, I think I've explained on previous episodes, Take That were in most people's lives because their music was so huge here. And I remember, you know, during my sort of sixth form school years and university years, the Take That songs were, you know, part of that generation of growing up. And uh, so that story... And the breakup was, yeah, I mean, head, well, it's headline news, wasn't yeah. it? It was in the news for quite some time. Uh, so whether you were a fan or not a fan, you knew the story. Yeah. So in the U.S., it was just the music mm. and the image. We didn't know the history, and we had no prior emotional attachment to Robbie Williams. So I think that theory, and then I think... Well, Robbie Williams succeeds in other countries in the world where Take That were not a well-known band. Yeah. So I remain baffled. Robbie Williams, America's loss, and too bad for America for not embracing the Robster. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we've got to know Paul a little bit better and hear all his stories, which me and Matt didn't know because, as we said, we haven't met in person before. We can move on to the album Sing When You're Winning. So Sing When You're Winning was released on the 28th of August 2000. It was produced by Guy and Steve Power and is his fourth best-selling album in the UK as well as globally. Selling six million copies worldwide, it went two times platinum in the first week alone in the UK, selling 313,000 copies and it stayed at number one for three weeks, remained in the top 10 for 20 weeks and the top 40 for 46 weeks went on to become eight times platinum, selling 2.2 million copies by 2019. And it was number two in the year-end chart of 2000, beaten by the Beatles 1 compilation. It was also number 32 in the year-end chart of 2001. Wow. Long longevity again in yeah. this album. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Sing When You're Winning has sold 4 million copies in Europe, achieving four times platinum status. It went 11 times platinum in Ireland, seven times in New Zealand, three times in Australia. It was also platinum in, wait for it, Belgium, Denmark, Italy, Netherlands, Switzerland, Taiwan, silver in Chile, gold in Argentina, Mexico, Austria, Finland, France, Norway, Spain, Sweden, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, and Canada. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of countries. <laughs> yeah, very successful. So it reached number one in Germany, Ireland, and New Zealand. It was number two in Switzerland, three in Holland, four in Austria and Sweden, five in Denmark, Italy, and Norway, 
And as Paul said, even got to number 110 in the USA. Rob said at the time, I want to beat what I did on the last album. With Life Through a Lens, Guy and I were just finding out what each other could do. I've been expecting you, we progressed to something that was better than the first. And now this one's just gone to a different plateau. There's a lot more grown up stuff on this. Every track is a solid track on this album. I want people to think, oh, he's getting there, isn't he? You know, I want them to have a good time, be sad, be in different moods. However, later in 2002, three, as covered in his book, Feel, Rob told Guy he wasn't happy in retrospect with the polish sheen of this album. Guy said they'd always agreed on everything before, but Rob said it's because he was always pissed before and didn't care. (laughs) (laughs) Or drunk, as uh, some people may understand better. The European promo for the album apparently went wrong because Rob wasn't interested in promoting it. He did the London press interviews, but gave the interviewers increasingly weird answers. Apparently one time he described the Sound of Music plot to an interviewer. (laughs) So Josie and EMI cancelled the rest of his press commitments. Rob said on Sing, I hated the record. I was a man on a mission of destruction. Mm. Can you believe that? And to think that he didn't rate it is shocking, isn't it? Yeah, quite. Do you think in this album it went a little bit more mainstream pop than than before which yeah. had still had a little bit of an indie almost rock not rock but you know what i mean indie, indie rock vibe. type yeah. vibe yeah yeah it could be that do you think that robbie was maybe concerned about moving into being a pop back star. to pop <laughs> yeah. i don't know it could it could be theory. that yeah could be so um paul m smith photographed rob for the album artwork at chelsea's stamford bridge and Rob's complete football strip, including signed jockstrap, <laughs> was later sold at Rob's Bid It Some auction to raise money for his charity Give It Some. And early copies of the album don't include Robbie's name or the album title or a track listing on the back. But these were changed for future releases. Rob said in his book, You Know Me, it's definitely my best artwork, probably one of the best that there's ever been. I think me pissing up the walls is my (laughs) favourite. And the dedication at the back inside the um, album reads, to Guy, who is as much Robbie as I am, which is always nice. I got to agree with Robbie that it's the best album artwork. I adore the album artwork. Yeah. Um, Especially the cover and with him winning the cup and the shot of the different Robbies in the tub at the end. Oh, God, I love that one. <laughs> um, that is funny. It's sexy. It's absolutely iconic. Yes. I actually got the vinyl album uh, months after I got the CD. I got the vinyl album thinking that if I ever met Rob someday, I'd like him to sign the album cover. Yeah. Would you get him to sign the cover or would you get him to sign the bath scene? <laughs> <laughs> I, I could. I, I, I imagine the cover yeah. of it and then I would frame it. Yeah. Now, even though I've, I uh, did the meet and greet with Rob, I never had the album on hand for him to sign. No. So that is an unrealized dream. Yeah, maybe one day. Hopefully. That'd be good. I really love the artwork. Yeah. And um, the fold out in the middle where Robbie's... Um, got his pants down like you know there's lots of different robbies on the football pitch one of them has got their pants and shorts down with their back to them and then there's a naked streaker yeah going across the pitch which is him and um it's funny for me and matt because stamford bridge where it's shot is the place where robbie first knew us as mr and mrs champion and shook our hands nice yes in the heart gig that we went to so yeah stamford bridge now has a special place in my heart even though i'm not interested in football <laughs> but i think he also had a special place in his heart for something that you gave him well i gig. gave him a terry's chocolate <laughs> orange during the gig yeah so, so there was a Aww. chocolate bribe involved but he did <laughs> but he did he did know who we were. yeah but it's ever since then that he's remembered our names so yes yeah he was very he was very lovely and very gracious at that gig that is yeah. so sweet um, and then one of my regrets, actually, from that album cover is on that tour, they were selling that top as one of the merchandise items. And I regret that I never bought that because at the time, you know, I was only just moved to London. I was a yeah. very low paid 
PR assistant and couldn't afford to buy lots of merchandise. I think I just got the program. So that's a regret not having that. Did it have a Williams 8 on the back? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. So I would love that too. Yeah. So you missed out on that. That is a cool looking shirt. Yeah, it really is. I'm always jealous when I see people at concerts. With them on. <laughs> we need we need some we need a campaign for some retro merchandise yeah. re-releases. <laughs> Maybe they'll do that for the 25th year. Next Wouldn't year. that be a good idea, yeah. Robbie Williams, the management team for the 25th <laughs> anniversary year? <laughs> You'd make some money from it. We want it. <laughs> yeah. Um. So review rise enemy in August 2000 said. As a perfect meeting of style and content, therefore, it's a masterpiece. This being another Robbie Williams record that says, I am Robbie Williams, the pop star. The tunes here expertly, though maybe not as expertly or or exuberantly as they did before, push your various pop music buttons. Ian Drury, the single rock DJ. The Divine Comedy, Road to Mandalay. Gloria Gaynor, Supreme. Country music, if it's hurting you. And Kraut Rock, all right, but maybe next time. All different stylistic bases are covered. I'm not really sure whether that's a good review or not from Enemy, but it's that's their review. We've included (laughs) the reviews for their last albums, so I thought we'd include it for this one. (laughs) Yeah, we've got a bit of a a theme of Enemy review comments. I think that's just because I used to get the Enemy and I've got all the clippings still. So (laughs) So they're, They're interesting. Sometimes they're a bit odd and a bit off but yeah yeah. it brings out how eclectic robbie's music is and it only got more eclectic as his career has gone on yeah 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 really really eclectic mix wikipedia states whereas i've been expecting you use the brit pop genre for its overall sound sing when you're winning incorporates a more post-millennial dance pop approach while utilizing classic british rock elements I just thought that was a good good summary, so put that in there. Rob won Best British Male Solo Artist and was nominated for Best Album for Sing When You're Winning at the Brits 2001. He won Best Male Solo at the Capital Radio 2000 Awards and Best Album for Sing When You're Winning at the 2001 Ceremony. He also picked up the Best Songwriter from Q Magazine and Sexiest Male from Company Magazine. He was nominated for Best Male and Best Pop Star and Best UK and Ireland Act at the MTV EMAs in 2000. Great. So that's a good summary of Sing When You're Winning. Well, Sing When You're Winning, the title of the album refers to a popular football chant, um, soccer chant for the American listeners. You only sing when you're winning, sing when you're winning. The first time I heard the expression was in the song Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba. They started with, we'll be singing... When we're winning. And that was a big yeah. hit in the USA in 1998. Yeah. And I read in a book somewhere that the title of Robbie's album, Sing When You're Winning, was a triumphant title and a knock on Gary Barlow, whose second solo album had failed to take off. And Barlow had quit his singing career at that point. Now, the angle about Gary Barlow may or may not be what Rob had in mind with the title. But there's no doubt that Robbie Williams was singing and winning when this album was released. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I never knew that. No. I never made that c- a connection with... Um, a Chumpa Wumba song, Chumpa Wumba, no. no. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I'd say that definitely it was to do with the football chant, with him being obsessed with football. But obviously, yeah, you're right. The theme. Uh, he was definitely it, uh, winning yeah. at the time, so... Yeah. Yeah. Multiple meanings. So let's move on to the first song, which is Let Love Be Your Energy. Written by Rob and Guy, this was the fourth single released from Sing on the 9th of April 2001. It hit number 10 in the UK, 11 in New Zealand. It was later released in 2002 in Australia, but only reached number 53. Two CD versions were available, both including B-side Rolling Stone, and one also featuring My Way Live and a video of My Way Live. So yeah, what do we think of Let Love Be Your Energy? The lyric, if you're willing to change the world, let love be your energy. I almost teared up just saying that. That lyric is phenomenal. In fact, it's my favorite lyric of all of Robbie's songs. Do you know if Robbie wrote those words? 
I'd presume so. He normally writes the lyrics. That lyric could be kind of an inspirational quote you'd see framed on a wall, and I'm sure many people have those words as a tattoo. It's so true how powerful love can be when trying to make a change in your life or in the world. I also love the opening lines. Out of a million seeds, only the strongest one breeds. You made a miracle, mother. I'll make a man out of me. It's about the miracle of creating life. Yet after conception, after we've been raised, once we're adults, it's up to us to make something good out of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good analogy. And I totally agree with you on if you're willing to change the world, let love be your energy. And to me, at a guess, I would say that is Rob. That sounds that sounds like Rob to me. Um, and I and I do. I think that's extremely true. I've just put in my notes here. You know, love can change the world. And yeah, I think I, I really love that line. And I, I I love the 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 kind of rock beat and the feel of this one as well. And and that that contrasted with the sort of strange weather guy in the background. You know, he's sort of giving a little weather report while Robbie is singing. I don't remember that. <laughs> oh, yes, there's a voice in <laughs> there. Today it will there. be cloudy. With it. You can't really make it out, but it's just a very small sample of a sort of British, Oh, yeah, I do remember that bit, yes. Plummy sort of British voice saying, yeah. saying some sort of weather report line. Yeah. Um, just when, I think it's when he says, Daddy, where's the sun gone from the sky? So in summary, showers. Is yes, I, don't yes. Know. I, just, I just find <laughs> those those odd little bits uh, just make it. Uh, it's just different. Maybe it was a British accent for me, but I never understood what the voice was saying. So I'm going to listen very carefully now because I had no idea it had anything to do with weather. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried a few times. I still can't quite make it out. So let me know, Paul, if you do. <laughs> when we get to that lyric, Daddy, where's the sun gone from the sky? The guitar and the chords Remind me of the Beatles, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds in the psychedelic genre. Yeah. Mm. And with the lyrics, Daddy, Where's the Sun Gone from the Sky, the chord change and the music change so abruptly and in such a beautiful way, it took me a while to notice how grim the lyrics got, asking why the sun died and getting no reply from the grown-ups. Yeah, that that was a lyric that struck me the most from the song as well. It's kind of sad it's worrying because that actually is how the world is going you know with climate change and everything it's sort of scary for the children's future and the adults have got no way of fixing things yeah if you yeah and if you want to come make a stance so when it's in your hands people show me love it's a very deep song really isn't it i'd say very profound yeah very, and I, yeah, I think I'd describe it as quite a, a rich song in terms of the depth of, you know, the, the, it's, it's, it's full on. There's lots of instruments, there's rich vocals going through it, the sound effects. And you think about it, there's a lot going on in that song. Yeah. And I was listening to it the other day and I even like noticed, I, I, I knew that the weather guy was in there, but I just noticed bits I hadn't heard before because I was really listening to it in a different way. There's also a child's voice saying, let love be your energy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very moving. But saying that, it's probably one of my least favorite songs on the album. Even though the lyrics are very good. Yeah. There's just so many songs on the album that I love. Right. This one ends up sort of going down. Not not that I don't like it. I do like it. But if it's you had just, to prioritise. Yeah, if I had to prioritise, <laughs> it wouldn't be up there compared to other songs on the album for me. Right. But I do love it when he sings it live. It's uh, very good. Like, you know, gets the crowd going. Hi, I'm Robbie Williams, and you're listening to Robbie Williams Rewind with the Champions. So let's talk about the video. And the video was the first not to feature Robbie himself. Instead, it was an animated Rob running around the world in search of love. And there were actually two versions, one with nudity and sex and one without those bits. 
It was created by Ed Bignall at Passion Pictures, who also worked on Damon Albarn's Gorillas animations. Which makes sense, the gorillas. If yeah. you've seen any of the gorillas, yeah, uh, animations, and in fact, the, the the band always appeared as animations. Didn't yeah, they? I think even was, yeah. even live. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I seem to remember Robbie saying at the time that he just couldn't be bothered to do another video shoot, right? And that's why this one was a cartoon because <laughs> <laughs> he hate, he always has hated doing video shoots. Really, hasn't he? He always says that it's quite boring most of the time. Which is why I think he ends up kissing lots of women in it because the <laughs> directors are trying to make it interesting for him. <laughs> it's a shame that he thinks like that, though, or was did think like that because he's such a great actor. When he gets yeah. out there and plays the part, you know, whatever they want him to do, he just gets out there and smashes it. But I think <laughs> we've been rewatching this video a few times recently, Paul. As no doubt you have, and. Um, Again, I think I saw more as I was watching it. And, you know, it's quite a risque, you know, if you watch the, the full version, the nudity version, um, starts off looking like quite an innocent cartoon story and then sort of flips into a car- cartoon porno, <laughs> it seems, um, where the Robbie character starts getting very sensual uh, indeed with, with the other characters at various points. And... Uh, yeah, no wonder they needed a second version that could go out, yeah. you know, on MTV during the daytime, I guess. Well, our friend actually worked on Saturday morning t- kids TV at the time, and he can remember having to watch it and make sure that the, the version they were showing was going to be clean enough for children to watch. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was shocked by the unapologetic sex scenes and the yeah. amount of male nudity in the video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, This gets to one of the reasons why Robbie became my favorite pop star in the matter of a month. (laughs) In his early career, through the Rock DJ video and sometimes right up until today, even though he's married, monogamous, and calmed down, he celebrates his own nudity. And he works out. He lifts weights. He's not hard on the eyes. Right after I'd purchased a Sing When You're Winning CD, I noticed there was also in that same shop a DVD called Robbie Williams' Angels, and the video for Angels was on it, Lazy Days, and even a few poems he wrote and is reading on that DVD. So maybe a week or two after I had the Sing When You're Winning CD, I get this DVD with the poems on it, and this DVD is really my first glimpse into Robbie's personality. I hadn't seen him interviewed. I'd hardly heard him speak, unless you count the rapping on the album. So one of the poems starts with, I'm naked at an awards ceremony, and Robbie is reading it shirtless. Okay, I think. He's very comfortable with his own nudity, and why shouldn't he be? He's a handsome, fit guy. The poem also shows how he's a funny guy. On that DVD, his sense of humor was apparent and delightful. So what made Robbie Williams someone who was the perfect pop star for me to follow was the Rock DJ video, his high level of comfort with sexuality and nudity, and all those amazing songs on his third album, such as Let Love Be Your Energy. Wow. Yeah. Um, also, my favorite part of that video is the very end where the um, the volcano erupts at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and only Robbie could, symbolically. <laughs> could get away with putting something like that in one of his videos. <laughs> You had a you had another note there, Lucy, which you haven't actually. Uh, oh well, Paul said. did allude to that. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I you... want to hear you say it as well. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually see his willy wobbling about. <laughs> <laughs> Bless him for it's, that. It's funny. Bless animated Robbie for that. <laughs> yes, it does uh, make me laugh. So, should we move on to Better Man? I can't wait. Okay, so Better Man was written by Rob and Guy, and this was released as a single in Australia, New Zealand and Latin America only. It made number four in New Zealand in December 2000, and it was number six in Australia in October 2001, where it was certified gold, selling 35,000 copies and was in the top 50 for 29 weeks. It made number 31 in the 2002 year end chart in Australia. The CD had My Way, Live, Rolling Stone, Toxic and Let Love Be Your Energy video as B-sides 
and it's still one of Robbie's top tracks in Australia. Mm. A Spanish version of Better Man called Ser Mejor, it means to be better. And that was included on the Latin American pressings of Sing When You're Winning and released as a single to Spanish-speaking countries in February 2001. Rob apparently had the words said to him and sung them one at a time phonetically while recording it. He said he found it very difficult. And um, I don't know what video accompanied this as a single because I can't find an official one anywhere, but I, I presume that the Australians just used a video of him singing it live in Manchester from the um, the televised concert because he sung it there. So mm. I'm guessing that's what they used. Rob said that he was in France in the mountains and he asked John Lennon for a song. All of a sudden, I did these chords that I'd never done before and sang the song, almost all of it, straight away. So I went and recorded it that night and I just cried and cried and cried my eyes out singing this song. And I knew I was onto a winner if it was making me cry. The last one that made me cry was Angels. It's just about feeling a bit sad and a bit sorry for yourself and not knowing how to get out of a rut. I find that beautiful. Yeah. This song is absolutely beautiful. It starts out simply with a guitar and some heartfelt vocals, touching words from Rob, asking for someone to love him and keep him safe from harm. Here's one thing I relate to in Rob. Rob is not afraid to show vulnerability. Many male singers would never show this level of vulnerability, especially many American male singers that I was used to. Here is Rob telling us how fragile he is. And beyond the request to be sent someone to love him, the standout lyrics for me come in the chorus. Lord, I'm doing all I can to be a better man. This is an anthem for self-improvement. And that effort of Rob's is one of the things about him that I respect the most. I used to write about this often on Robbie's fan website. Several years ago, after seeing the Take the Crown stadium show, you know how we fans write messages on Robbie's website. Well, there were often times that I would write with a real honesty on his website, and I wrote, Rob has discussed his selfish tendencies in interviews, as well as his admirable desire to conquer them. I, too, am rather selfish, and I am working on being less selfish. I think that most of the people on this website are here because we do see the good in Robbie Williams. I don't have sports heroes or political heroes. Robert Williams is my hero because he works towards self-improvement. He's a funny guy, and his pop music consistently rises above the rest. And sometimes I have written direct messages to Rob. I wrote to him, Thank you for showing us your vulnerability and sensitive side time and time again. Thank you for having the strength to chase your demons away. We all like a healthy Robbie. So one of the ways Rob has improved himself is by working on staying away from controlled substances. When mm. I first heard Better Man in the year 2000, I had no idea what struggles Rob had had with alcohol and drugs. But that simple message of wanting to be a better person and working toward it, I related to that right away. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful song, isn't it? You can really feel the emotions as he's singing it. Yeah, absolutely. And he has become a better man. Yeah, absolutely. He has. We've, we've, we've seen it. We've seen the, the transformation over the years. It's uh, quite incredible. Yeah. And but but still, you're right, Lucy. The song is still full with that same level of emotion as right right, right back then. And yeah. he continues to include it in his set list a lot. Um, which is great for the for the fans that love it, especially in Australia, New Zealand and Latin America. And of course, he's sung it with his dad, Pete, on stage a lot too, like on the Let Me Entertain You tour in 2015. And uh, many people probably already know this, but Rob's biopic film, which is due to start recording next year in 2022, is going to be called Better Man. I think that's a, a fitting title for his film. That is fantastic as a title. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned Pete Conway and how they sang it in 2015. Yeah. They also sang it during that Robbie Rocks Big Ben Live, a New Year's Eve event to ring in yeah, the year that's right. 2017. We, we were there. <laughs> that was a fantastic live Robbie show on New Year's Eve that I watched online. And Rob was later in an internet chat with his fans, and he was expressing some disappointment with the show and yeah. possibly with the press coverage of that show. They'd criticized his use of hand sanitizer yeah. 
after touching hands from the audience. And I always thought, Rob has young kids at home to protect. Of course he's going to use hand sanitizer. Anyway, I found that whole Big Ben live concert to be so moving that I later wrote a message to Rob, and I got a really lovely, sweet reply from him. I wrote this to help him feel a little better because he seemed down about that event, and I wrote, because the show was streaming online all over the world, you were reaching fans in many different countries. These people, myself included, sought out the stream, not to judge you harshly or to catch you should you fail, but to celebrate the holiday with you, celebrate life and music with your fans around the globe. You had friends of mine watching in other parts of the U.S. My mother was watching way on the other side of the country, singing and clapping to and laughing at your anecdotes. You were bonding us together as we all watched at the same time. Because the stream was live, I felt tuned into something absolutely amazing that night. You helped me feel connected to something bigger than myself, bigger than the United States. I felt connected to a very special world. I could not have cared less what was going on in Times Square that night. Mm -hmm. I rang in the new year with Robbie Williams. And Rob was very sweet and responded to me, genuinely touched AP, so well written too. Much love, mate. Now to have my favorite performer and a phenomenal songwriter compliment my writing, That just makes me feel really good about Rob's humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Rob has this beautiful soul and has always been a superb influence in my life. And Rob has a lot of positive energy coming his way and a lot of love coming at him from fans, like the two of you, champions, and from me. When he writes something like, much love, mate, it goes right to my heart and confirms that Rob is an extraordinary person, pop star or not. He's a special human yes, being. it's definitely the case. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, my um, uncle in France was watching that concert live as well. Yeah. My um, was it a, One of my cousins sent a photo to me of him stood up in front of the telly, like with a <laughs> massive grin on his face, just absolutely loving it. <laughs> yeah. My mother sent me a photo of the dog watching Robbie Williams live <laughs> that night. <laughs> I think it helped that me and Matt kept being on the telly a lot, though, because we were in the front row and unfortunately the camera was right in front of us and kept doing close-ups of me and Matt. And um, That is fantastic. Yeah, but everyone we knew (laughs) saw us on telly that night. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we've been on TV a little bit before on certain things, but that night, I mean, everyone watches the New Year's Eve show pretty much. And yeah, we, we... I received so many texts, so many messages the next day, yeah. even from people that I hadn't worked with for like 10 years. And even 10 years ago, they were texting me saying, Matt, I'm sure I saw you and Lucy on <laughs> on the concert. <laughs> oh, that's great. Night. Yeah. yeah. But we do remember, Paul, exactly what the story yeah. you just uh, recounted yeah. about coming out of that gig and then him chatting and saying, well, that he hated I, it. I was absolutely shitting myself and really didn't feel good. And but we were, you know, what you saw it. It was incredible performance. He he gave it his all. But um, yeah, he you, said all he could think about was all the people all around the world watching who hated him and were being forced to watch because someone they were with wanted to watch it, but they didn't. And he said that's all he could wow. think of. Yeah. Wow, isn't that horrible? Um, yeah, that's horrible. So I must have heard that, and that's why I wrote that yes, message. Yeah. But uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, when I think about Better Man, I, I think you're saying because I see it in your notes. Yeah. Um, we think of Papa Pete. We think of Pete Conway because yeah. we've seen him sing it so many times with his dad, and it is such a, a touching performance that you know. I think Rob starts to sing it and then Pete sort of comes out yeah. a few bars in, doesn't he? And, yeah. and starts singing his part. And uh, obviously his dad's got quite a deep voice. Yeah. And so it's quite a contrast, but it's just, I think it's beautiful that they've got to sing it live in so many different countries around the world um, together. I think that's really lovely. And also because of the fact that Robbie has become a better man. A better man. And he is singing it with his dad. It makes yeah. it more... And and I think his vocal on this one is just superb. I mean, I just love the way he sings this. Um, 
I think it's, you know, it's one of those tracks again with just that simple acoustic guitar behind him to begin with for the first verse and the chorus and then the drums and the piano come in and the orchestral strings. I've mentioned this before, you know, but it's a really lovely arrangement by Guy, the way it kind of builds up. Yeah. And then the, yeah, it's just beautiful. I love the middle eight, too. I think it's gorgeous. Once you found that lover, you're homeward bound. I love the music there, the chords, the soaring backing yeah. vocals. Yeah, it's incredible. It's a, just a beautiful song, really is. Should we go on to Rock DJ now? Yeah. <laughs> if you twist my arm. <laughs> okay. Let's do it. So Rock DJ was written by Rob Guy, Kelvin Andrews, Nelson Pigford, and Ekundeo Paris. This was the first single to be released from the album and gave Rob his third UK number one. It came out on the 31st of July 2000 and sold 200,000 copies in its first week in the UK and is now a platinum record, having shifted nearly 700,000 copies or 973,000 if you include streaming. It was the fourth best-selling song of 2000 in the UK. It's now his third best-selling single overall, Behind Angels and Candy, having sold four million copies worldwide. With Rock DJ, he achieved his first number one in New Zealand, Argentina and Mexico, and was number one in Ireland, Iceland and Costa Rica. Number three in Italy, Spain, Czech Republic, four in Australia, six in Hungary, Netherlands and Portugal, and number 24 on the USA Billboard Hot Dance Club Play Chart but he didn't hit the Hot 100. It mm. went gold in New Zealand and platinum in Australia. The song samples strings from Barry White's It's Ecstasy When You Lay Down Next To Me and also contains a sample of Can I Kick It by A Tribe Called Quest and has a quote from la di da by Slick Rick and Doug E. Fresh. Rob said Calvin and Danny from Sound 5 were getting their set list together and it included Ecstasy by Barry White, and it sounded amazing. Their drummer broke his arm, so they never used the track in their live set. Me and Guy had been writing on guitars, and I'd got bored of that and wanted to have some beats. We had an engineer who was supposed to be with us for a month, but left to work with Madonna and Kelvin and Danny came, and they brought the Ecstasy track. So Kelvin Andrews Mould is a DJ and producer, the older brother of Danny Spencer Mould, Danny was part of Candy Flip, who got to number three with a cover of Strawberry Fields in the UK, and they are both part of Sure Is Pure and Soul Mechanic. They've remixed Sister Sledge, The Doobie Brothers and Aretha Franklin, and have gone on to work with Rob on Rude Box, Reality Killed the Video Star, Swings Both Ways, and The Christmas Present. Kelvin said he had sp- has spent months at a time living with Rob in LA, working on music, sometimes 50 songs, for sometimes just one or two to end up on the album. But they enjoy the creative process together. Robbie had long been a fan of Danny and Kelvin's due to their shared birthplace and proclaimed, it's like finding two Pharrell Williams in (laughs) Stoke-on-Trent. Nelson Pigford wrote, it's ecstasy when you lay down next to me with Ekendeo Paris for Barry White. It was released on the 19th of August, 1977. Its Ecstasy peaked at number four on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1977. Mary J. Blige also sampled it on her You Bring Me Joy record in 1994. Nelson also performed on Gonna Fly Now, otherwise known as the theme from Rocky. Pickford and Paris were songwriting partners, but hadn't been writing together for a few years when Paris came up with the musical idea for the tune. He met Pickford to come up with the lyrics. The song wasn't written with anyone in mind, but came to Barry White by chance when a friend in common told them Barry was looking for new material. It ended up being number one on the R&B chart for five weeks in the USA. So it took Rob a long time to get the lyrics done. He said, there were about three or four different drafts for what it was going to become, and I wasn't happy with any of them. In fact, I wasn't happy with what we came up with in the end, because I didn't know what I wanted to convey. But as the deadline approached, that's what we had. So that's what we went with. There's a big issue of liking this song because I don't. That's what he said Mm. quite a while ago. Not sure if he still feels the same. Yeah. So there's footage of him sat with Guy trying to write it saying, 
what would Ian say, as in Ian Drury? Yeah. Then he immediately comes up with, have a proper giggle, I'll be quite polite. He, descri- <laughs> <laughs> he described it as a party song and that they usually have inane lyrics. He said, everything else on the album has been sad. Ooh, I need love. Ooh, I'm lonely. It's not a depressing album, but it has been about sadness, being lonely and being depressed, but in an upbeat way. They were still adjusting the lyrics as they recorded it. Someone in the mixing desk asked whether they could talk about pimping and Guy pointed out that they'd already said, give no head, no backstage passes. So they were already in the shit. (laughs) (laughs) I remember that footage too. (laughs) Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? Watching him recording it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And writing it. Yeah. Fascinating. Because it's such an epic song that's just part of Robbie now. You kind of almost can't imagine him without without it. It's so Robbie. (laughs) <laughs> he saves it for near the end of most of the shows yeah. because it's such a yeah. big song. Yeah, I still love it. It's such a great, fun song. It's got a great energy. Yeah. It's amazing live. It really gets the crowd going. I love the rap in the song. Yes, so do I. The only British act at the time that I was used to hearing speak in some of the songs were the Pet Shop Boys. Like when Neil Tennant would rap, I bought you drinks, I brought you flowers, I read you books and talked for hours. So here's another British guy rapping. And I think Rob's accent is absolutely charming, by the way. And I love his speaking mm. voice. Yes. Yeah. It's it's one of those songs, isn't it? That's just, I mean, obviously we're fans and we like it, so we're a bit biased, but the opening few bars, did, did, it's so recognizable. Mm. You know, if you're in a bar or at a party or wherever, and you hear those first few notes, you know, I, I don't know, it still gives me a buzz when I hear it. Yeah. It doesn't matter where I am. I just, I feel like a tingling yeah. of energy. It's, uh, yeah, and it takes me right back to, the you know, being in the stadiums when it comes on and the hand movements to the song, you know, <laughs> that's quite an important part of it, isn't it? Yeah. I feel like you sort of feel the song go through you almost with the yeah. vibrations of the bass and the tune. I feel like you can actually feel the song physically when you see when you're watching him live and he plays oh, very it. Very much agreed. Yeah. <laughs> I have to own up here. There's a bit of an observation from me on the read lyrics. It it was a really, really long time before I actually realised that the lyric give no head no backstage passes was actually you know in there yeah i mean i I think you know i just always used to sing it and not really think a lot of it and then i said to lucy was there a radio edit version of this song because you know it's a bit yeah but it's just it doesn't you know a child listening child wouldn't wouldn't necessarily know know what that that means i know but um like guy said you know we're already in the shit (laughs) it's better than that (laughs) <laughs> I just, yeah, it just surprised me. I've like, I like the line, I've got the gift, going to stick it in the goal as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this song comes from a long line of I don't want to songs. Um, I don't want to dance. I don't want to rock. And these songs are often so catchy that the listener always wants to dance. Like Fred Astaire yes. saying, I won't dance in the 1930s in a movie called Roberta. Yeah. And later after Rock DJ, we had Scissor Sisters singing I Don't Feel Like Dancing. And just recently, the Pet Shop Boys on their latest album, they sing I Don't Want to Go Out, I Don't Want to Go Dancing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. But I got to admit, I don't know what this song is well, about. Yeah, they are inane lyrics, as he says. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I can help you with that. Because <laughs> I think he does want to rock. Yeah. (laughs) I think he does. There was one day I was at work in the year 2000 and hard at work on a project with a colleague. And I sometimes sing while I'm at work. And I kept singing, so if you're selling it, selling it, selling it, it's all right. And I think I was actually (laughs) imitating Rob from the behind the scenes footage of the recording of the song or something like that. And I had that part stuck in my head. By the end of the day, my colleague who had never heard the song Rock DJ was singing, so if you're selling it, selling it, selling it. (laughs) (laughs) It's infectious. It's that good. Yeah. Rock DJ won Best British Single and Video at the 2001 Brits. It won Best Song at the MTV EMAs 2000. It won Best Visual Effects at the MTV Video Music Awards in 2001. 
and was nominated for Best Male Video and Best Breakthrough Video. Rock DJ was nominated for an Ivor Novello in 2001 for Most Performed Work. In 2006, it was voted by viewers as the seventh most groundbreaking video ever on MTV. Wow. So the award-winning video was directed by Vaughan Arnell. In a video, Rob explains the storyboard and that he's dancing like John Travolta. He said he'd asked two guys he'd met while filming the Pepsi commercial to come up with the concept. So Rob's basically like a target sign coming up from the floor in a 360 degree space with speakers all around. And there's 50 girls in four gangs going around him on roller skates. Mm. So one of the models in the video was Elizabeth Jagger, daughter of Mick and Jerry Hall. And the model DJ, Lauren Gold, Rob met in a hotel bar. She swiftly got a call from her agent offering her the part and was told it was because Rob had asked for her. He had a cast of his own head done and wore a motion capture outfit for the skeleton parts. He wore his muscle outfit out after the shoot to a petrol station, a pub, then in the street when a police car drove past as he was wearing it. (laughs) I'm sure you've seen that footage. Yes. (laughs) Very funny. Uh, when we say the costume, you mean that the final, oh, the, the muscle well, out, yeah, you said the muscle outfit. So yeah. it's like the, almost the final bit before he becomes a skeleton. Before he rips all his Basically muscles Basically the off. red. Looking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rob said in You Know Me, I think this video was another tipping point for who I was going to be as a personality or as an entertainer. To begin with, I kind of saw myself as the lead singer of a band. And then all of a sudden I was becoming a pop star. And I didn't notice. I think it was a natural progression. But looking back now, it's, oh, yeah, those were the videos that did it. And the video was actually banned on most channels in the UK. And many used a studio recording version instead, which apparently still gets used now rather than an edited version of the original. And the video was completely banned in the Dominican Republic due to allegations of Satanism. (laughs) Wow. <laughs> did, I don't really see how that's related to Satanism. No, well did it did it get um did it get shown in the US Paul? I never once saw it on TV, but MTV did give it a video music award. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I sure never saw it. No. Right. Except that one night in the bar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the target that Robbie yeah. emerges from. Have you noticed in Rob's early videos, Lazy Days, for example, they shoot an arrow into a target, and in Angels, he's on a beach, and at one point it looks like he's in the middle of a target? I found that interesting that there's this target theme in his early videos. I wondered what was that all about? Maybe there's something symbolic about being in the target or in in the target sites, you know? Yeah. Maybe. I also kind of thought it had to do a little bit with the lyric, I've got the gift, going to stick it in the goal, sort of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love that the women are roller skating using the traditional roller skates. I spent a lot of my childhood on roller skates. And when I saw the Take That Progress Tour in 2011, the female dancers were on roller skates during Rock DJ. And I absolutely love that performance. It was that night and maybe that moment when I thought... Seeing Robbie Williams live, that must have been kind of like what it was like to see Elvis Presley live. Because I remember seeing footage of these women in this archival footage just crying during the Elvis Presley concerts. And I was wondering, like, what was going on? Like, what were they feeling? And then I see Robbie Williams during the Progress Tour. And I'd seen him live before. But that particular time, I thought, I really understand just the energy that – that that everybody is feeling. And I could totally understand why why people would be crying at an Elvis concert. Robbie Williams is very much like seeing Elvis Presley perform. Yeah. Yeah. Especially at that point in progress where we hadn't seen him live for five years, really, in a concert. Oh, yeah. And it was so exciting to see him live again, back doing his thing. That yeah, it was very emotional. And yeah, I don't think I cried, but <laughs> certainly very excited. <laughs> Um, so the video was actually played in front of a celebrity audience at a Top of the Pops recording on the 6th of July 2000. And according to Top of the Pops producer Chris Cowie, it left Posh Spice, Mel C, 
Dane Bowers and Destiny's Child with their jaws on the floor. (laughs) Chris Cowie fought to have the full video shown on top of the pops. The first two minutes at 7.30, but the full video on a late night repeat. And director Vaughan said, the first person to see it was Sarah Cox, who was then Radio 1 Breakfast show host and a big Robbie fan. And apparently she was (laughs) (laughs) shell-shocked. Hi, I'm Robbie Williams, and you're listening to Robbie Williams Rewind with the Champions. What I love about the video is that they have turned it to 4K now, and you can really see it in its full glory, because that's the video. (laughs) That's the video we need to see in 4K. (laughs) Is that online, or how do you see that? Yeah, it's on YouTube in 4K. So if you've got a 4K telly, it plays in like the best quality ever. I will have to definitely look into that. Yes. It's actually on the official Robin Williams uh, channel. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's quite it's quite spectacular to see in 4K because there is uh, yeah more detail. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a crisp, sharp video of um, yeah of Robbie in his pants. <laughs> when Robbie is fully nude in the video, I imagine there's still a blur. Oh, it's still a blur there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Maybe not as blurry. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still still blurred. <laughs> But it's also, I find it weird watching him doing that without all his tattoos as well. Yeah. You know, especially the one across the top of his chest. He hasn't got yes. that at that point. And it's always a bit, you know, he just looks so much younger in that video. Yes. It's definitely one of his best videos as well, I'd say. Oh, absolutely. This is just iconic, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I think they knew full well what they were doing when they were creating, yeah. de- developing the creative concept for that video. They wanted some shock and awe and uh, people talking about it and (laughs) they certainly were here i mean if i remember back yeah people were like have you seen that video have you seen (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah so it did have the the desired effect i think um i i just remember we've obviously talked a little paul was sort of explaining a little bit about how the video went earlier on and um obviously when he starts pulling his skin off um that's one thing that's quite freaky but then when he starts peeling off different muscles and, and then lobbing them at the girls, and then the girls start licking them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. It's... Well, maybe that's why they were saying it's satanic, because they're like eating his mu- eating. Yeah, him they're kind of yeah. Yeah, consuming him <laughs> um, in a way, yes. They look um, very ravenous. Yeah. <laughs> It's just like that point where you don't think you could get a lot of stranger and then he's handing out, you know, bits of muscle for people to eat. (laughs) Yeah, that video starts out very sexual and then becomes gory. Yeah. And a little frightening. Yeah. Yeah. And and one thing I would say is, bear in mind, if I've got this right, it was 21 years ago. Yeah. So 21 years ago... If you think about it, that is incredible CGI and effects in that video to yeah. to, to make it for it still to look so good. Definitely, um, yeah, it's yeah, it must have cost a fortune. Yeah, yeah, I think it holds up very well today. Yeah, yeah. it always makes me so smile when it says "No Robbies were harmed in the making of this video" at the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, should we move on to Supreme? I yeah. think so. Okay. Yeah. Supreme was the third single released off the album, released on the 11th of December 2000, written by Robbie, Guy, Freddie Perrin and Dino Ficaris. It got to number four in the UK, selling 200,000 copies to make it a silver record. It made number one in Hungary and Poland, three in Austria and New Zealand, four in Belgium, Italy and Switzerland. And Supreme was also very popular in South Korea. Rob recorded a French version, which peaked at number 12 and spent 34 weeks on the French chart. L'Amour Supreme achieved gold in France, selling 250,000 copies. The bridge contains some of the string melodies from Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive, but it was re-recorded rather than sampled. Rob said that he was in Switzerland on New Year's Eve, sober, And at midnight, all the Europeans started singing that string line. And he thought, I'm having that. 
The other string extract that runs throughout the song from six seconds in is a Francois de Ruby composed piece from the film Dernier Domicile Connu. So Freddie Perrin is the American songwriter and producer who wrote I Will Survive. He also wrote one of my all-time favourite songs, I Want You Back by the Jackson 5. Oh, that is one of your all-time favourite songs. I had to get that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Yes. He worked on Motown, then Disco Records, and he won a Grammy for I Will Survive in 1980. Dino Ficaris wrote the song with Freddie, as well as others for Gloria Gaynor. The UK CD1 featured B-sides Don't Do Love and Come Take Me Over. The CD2 had the song United, as well as Supreme Live, Audio and Video from Manchester Arena. Supreme has also been the title theme song for the Polish TV drama series The Londoners since 2008. Ooh, didn't know that. Never heard of it, but I thought that was interesting. Supreme was nominated for Best Video at the 2002 Brits alongside Kids. It was also nominated for Best Video at the 2001 MTV EMAs. So, Paul, what do you think of Supreme? I think Supreme is freaking amazing. Yes. <laughs> I first heard Supreme on my car stereo with that newly purchased CD, probably the same day I got the CD. Part of those first four songs that really impressed me. Supreme may be the song that did it for me that quickly pushed Robbie over the edge and made him my favorite pop star. One thing is it's simply a great song. I love the crackle of the vinyl sound at the beginning. The music mm. is great. The melody is pleasing. The lyrics are superb. On my first listen, the lyrics, all the best women are married, all the handsome men are gay. Yes, that is a top line. That's what did it for me. Yeah. I'd like to share something I wrote directly to Rob as a fan making a comment on his website. I wrote this in 2013, 13 years after I first heard the song. Okay. Um, I wrote, I'll never forget the day when I first played Sing When You're Winning, my first Robbie CD, on a sunny late afternoon in my car in the year 2000. After hearing the brilliant first two tracks and after loving Rock DJ, I was hearing Supreme for the first time. And I heard the lyrics about the handsome men, and you probably became my favorite pop star at that moment. Four great pop songs in a row on that CD, and you're also the first pop star I knew whose lyrics included gay people instead of ignoring them, as is the norm in pop music. Your music is inclusive, it's fun, at times it's beautiful, and it's brilliant. I said in 2000 that you were the perfect pop star. It's 13 years later, Rob, and you are still the perfect pop star. Now, sometimes I, I read a message that, that I wrote years ago and I think I just I just gush <laughs> when I write to Rob but that's yeah. exactly how I felt at the time and I stand by those words even today and in just that line all the handsome men are gay he's not making fun of gay people he's actually being very respectful there and his career and his outlook have remained very respectful of gay people through the years with the occasional awkward moment when he's trying to be funny yeah. but bless him for being an open-minded, amazing guy when it comes to issues of sexuality. Gay people do not have a lot of representation in the world of pop music. And here, Rob has always shown support in his interviews and in his music itself. He's a straight guy, yet just about every album gives a respectful nod very directly in the lyrics to gay people and gay fans of his. So I am forever impressed with Robbie Williams for lyrics and actions that embrace diversity so openly and consistently. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm moved by what you said. <laughs> Very oh, bless moved you. indeed. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely so. Absolutely so. This wasn't the beginning, but this was part of a trajectory that wound up with him singing with Rufus Wainwright. Everybody swings both ways and Rufus is singing face it Robbie you're a little bit gay that's <laughs> yeah. very accepting and affirming yeah 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 for me it's a classic Robbie song and I absolutely love it I, I just from the from the looping strings and intro at the beginning again very iconic um instantly recognizable you know that that hook is just incredible at the beginning of the song, and I uh, and I really just love the way the song tells a story as well, and 
and the orchestral, you know, obviously there's a lot of orchestral um, arrangements, isn't there, in Robbie's yeah. songs. Um, and I think that's got a lot to do with Guy's influence. Uh, but it just makes the song sound so epic and so big. Um, but then I also love the little rap bit, you know, I spy with my little eye, something beginning with, <laughs> ah, got my back up. Uh, it, it, it just... I don't know. It just really works. Um, I I think I just quite literally like all of the lyrics on this song. It's just brilliant. Yeah. That's what I've got to say about it. What do you think, Lucy? (laughs) Well, I I like how he says, will you survive? You must survive. Seeing as they actually are sampling, I will survive. Yeah. I think that was quite clever. And one of my favourite lines, especially when he's singing it live, is, do you need a bit of rough? Get on your knees. (laughs) Because yes. you know the movement that he always does when he, uh, or he definitely always used to. I'm not sure he does so much now when he sings that line, yeah. gestures to the audience. Um, and yeah, I wondered, I guess at the time, it was about Rob's fruitless search for love, thinking that he was never going to settle down. Um, Interesting. But obviously, it's nice now, looking back, knowing that he has. Yeah. I find the lyrics to Supreme clever and funny. I love, are you questioning your size? Yes. Is there a tumor in your humor? Are there bags under your eyes? Do you leave dents where you sit? I love that. Yes, so are you do getting I. on a bit? <laughs> it's funny lyrics like that that add to the pleasure of listening to this song. Yeah. I think Rob writes very intelligent lyrics and his mastery over wit and rhyme just shines in this song. Yeah, it yes. definitely does. Yeah. As you said, you just love all the lyrics. You just I, almost can't pick I a favourite. I just love them you? all. I, yeah. I, I, I just, yeah. We've been listening probably like you, Paul. We've been listening to this album over and over and over again over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and every time this comes on, it's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. I eventually got the Canadian version of Sing When You're Winning. Oh, and you had mentioned the Spanish Better Man. Yeah. Well, it, the Canadian version has the Spanish Better Man oh. and the French version of Supreme called Supreme. Oh, does it? And Yeah. And in the days when I used to do karaoke around 20 years ago, I used to bring my own Robbie karaoke CD. And I once sang Supreme to the crowd who had never heard it before. And I included some of the French lyrics at the end. Wow. Dans le meilleur de toi, même, viens vivre un amour suprême. Tout le monde a besoin d'amour. So I think that that was brilliant that Rob did a French version of this song. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that helped him in Canada. Maybe that's one of the reasons the album did so well in Canada. Could very well be. And And Paul, you've given me a really good idea. So... Either when you come over to the UK or when we come over to the US, we're going to have a karaoke party. Oh, because, I don't know about that. Well, I, I certainly will. I, I love karaoke. <laughs> and That would be so much fun. Don't do it so much <laughs> these days, probably like yourself. But I, I certainly, during my um, maybe, yeah, 15, 20 years ago, I used to do a lot of karaoke. And um, yeah, I'd love to have a Robbie karaoke party. That'd be great. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. <laughs> Even if Lucy doesn't want to sing anything, she'll you'll enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah. <laughs> I love what Robbie did in 2013. He and Guy Chambers, I assume, turned Supreme into a swing song, and it appeared on the album Swings Both Ways and on the Swings Both Ways tour. And that's one of my very favorite shows of Robbie's. The song Supreme is brilliantly transformed into a swing song. It sounds like it could have been a standard from way back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It does, doesn't it? It really works. Yeah. As a swing song. Yeah. Funny thing about the Swings Both Ways tour is Robbie wore a tuxedo in that tour. And since my first exposure of ever seeing Robbie Williams was from the Millennium video where he's wearing a tuxedo. Yeah. I often associate Robbie Williams as this British guy in a tux. Oh. Right. And if he's not the British guy in a tux, he's the naked rapping British guy. <laughs> <laughs> So should we talk about the video? Yeah. So everyone's favorite, Vaughn on Al, directed the video saying, you have to let Rob do what Rob does best. He thought of using the golden age of sport and chose motor racing. He wanted it to be like Jackie Stewart versus James Hunt and inserted Robbie into real footage to make it like Bob v. Jackie. Rob had a pipe to be like an English gentleman. And the casting director had to cast people who looked like they could have been from the past so that they fitted right into the old footage. 
They didn't burn an actual racing car when they made it look like Rob crashed. They just set a ring of fire around one and used very clever camera trickery. Rob said that he was throwing up a lot on set after eating some pine nuts and he's never been able to eat them again. <laughs> there you go, it's a factoid for you. <laughs> and he also remarked, I think uh, an awful lot of my persona has been driven by Vaughan Arnell. He pushed me towards what he is and what he would like to be, which is like Steve McQueen and like Paul Newman, but also slapstick, carry-on films and saucy humour. He came up with great ideas and it was only in hindsight that I realised that that's shaping who you are and, and what you come across as. I have no regrets about any of that. I was a willing participant and it was a load of fun. He caught the essence of who I could be I was now driving the train of pop stardom. In Vaughan's videos, the character's always bigger than how I really think of me as a person. True. So I think it's just an amazing video. Like He always says that he wouldn't make a good actor. But you see in this, yeah. he's perfect. All those facial expressions. and Yeah. I love those facial expressions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It just fits right into the part. I mean, I guess he's not speaking in it, but facially, yeah, he does a great job acting. I don't know whether you, you may not know this, Paul, but I'm, I, I quite like my Formula One racing. And so for me, seeing a racing video based on that kind of theme it instantly appealed to me. And I think it's, it's just like a, an amazing homage to Jackie Stewart and others in the video. Um, and I, yeah, I just really love the... The creative styling of it, it's just really clever. But because of all of that and all the special effects, I can only assume that that video cost an absolute fortune to make. It, it just must have been an astronomical budget. Yeah. Um, there's just so much to it. You know, we watched the making of it recently, didn't we? Yeah. And um, there was a huge production team on it to, you know, develop it Um and I'm sure, it, well, we saw it required a massive amount of post-production as well with all the special effects and the morphing and the merging. Um, but yeah, I just, I love the fact that it tells such a, a story, you know, winning, scandal, crashing in flames, rushed off to the hospital, but Bob Williams make, makes a miracle escape and then comes back for the final showdown in Monaco. <laughs> And then he goes, well, I've said put, he goes for a poo, I don't know, he went, in, went in his caravan and went in the toilet <laughs> at the end. And his manager um, locks him in the caravan and he misses the race. <laughs> Bob Williams fails to show up. Yeah. Other headlines. So, yeah. Uh, what do you think, Paul? First of all, Matt, I wanted to say that when you were talking about being a Formula One racing fan i could see you light up <laughs> and that means you are making a really strong connection with yes. something that robbie williams is doing in yeah. a project of his and there are many instances where i have felt that same kind of connection with the material so i just find that delightful yeah. that you related to this video in that way and i'm sure that has to have something to do with your level of fandom with robbie williams that he would do something like this in a video yeah absolutely yeah 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 yeah, there's just there's just so much I like about the video. It's just a really great story. It's a really great performance. Um, I must admit, I hadn't watched it for a while, though, so the bit at the end I found rather shocking when I remembered that he didn't actually get to the race. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's a brilliant mixture of archival footage and the stuff they shot with Rob. Yes. When they yeah. shot it, it's it's very brilliantly edited together. Yeah. Yeah. And it does tell an entertaining story, and I like how the headlines help tell the story. Yeah. And it's an unexpected subject matter for the song Supreme. Yeah, very yeah. much so. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of She's the One. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in terms of having a, a sport be yeah. the subject of the video. Yeah. Were we talking to Sarah Hoyland about yeah. yeah, we were talking to Sarah about She's the One and yeah. she said exactly the same thing. Yeah. She said, the video doesn't go with the song. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's the point, I don't know. <laughs> it's eye-catching and it worked. Yeah. That's the thing. It's certainly a video that I had to seek out. Why? Right. Um, I don't remember the first time I saw it. It might have been online, possibly YouTube, but these videos were not being played for Americans. So I definitely had to seek out Let Love Be Your Energy and the video for... Supreme. Right. Yeah, I can imagine. 
So now we're going to move on to Kids. Released on the 9th of October 2000 and written by Guy and Rob, it was the second single taken from Sing When You're Winning. It was also Kylie's third single from Light Years, which was her first album under new record label Parlophone. It made number two in the UK with 235,000 sales, making it a silver record. U2's Beautiful Day was number one. It also reached three in Iceland, five in New Zealand, eight in Hungary, nine in Ireland and 14 in Australia. It was 76 on the end of year 2000 chart in the UK. Kylie asked Rob and Guy to write a song for her and they wrote Your Disco Needs You and she loved it so much they wrote another one. After writing Kids, Rob knew it had a massive chorus and thought, I want this song. He said, I played it to Kylie and she liked it and so we sang a duet together there and then. It's really sweet because I kind of wanted to have her say lots of dirty things to me, (laughs) but really wasn't brave enough to write the lyrics. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, He said he had a puppy dog crush and didn't know what to say. That he loved her since she was a mechanic in dungarees in Neighbours. I remember it well. Um... (laughs) It rocks live. It's got lots of power. It's as it's as ACDC as I will get. Bono sung it with Kylie in Sydney. Bono was saying he loves Robbie and he was trying to get into the Robbie vibe to play him on stage. And Kylie still now plays this on most of her tours too. Yeah. So I'm going to go first on kids. You go for it, Lucy. <laughs> so I love this song. Love. 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 (laughs) (laughs) Because I love Kylie as well. I've loved Kylie since she was in Neighbours. So when Robbie and Kylie sung together, for me, it was just the pinnacle of my pop, like, I don't know. Two of your pop icons just coming together. My favourite female pop star with my favourite male pop star. Yeah. Couldn't get any better. That is amazing. Literally, I was just absolutely (laughs) beyond myself with excitement. (laughs) I can just imagine that. So, and, you know, it's got such a good energy, great beat. Uh, it's amazing live at Robbie and Kylie's shows. Um, and But weirdly, I, I, I listened to a Kylie podcast um, with these two guys and they aren't so keen on kids because they feel it's more of a Robbie song than a Kylie song. And I, I can see that. You yeah, know, I can it, see that. You know, it doesn't sort of sound like the rest of Light Years. But anyway, for me, Robbie and Kylie together, you can't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely more of a Robbie song. Yeah. At the end of the song, he takes over completely. Yeah. With but that on Kylie's, rap. Uh, Kylie's album, his rap isn't on her album. Oh, I have never heard that version. Yeah. yeah. How interesting. So when she sings it live, she they don't have Robbie's rap on it, obviously. I can remember when we went to see him in Leeds in 2006 at Round Hay Park. Robbie oh, yeah. played this on the Close Encounters tour. And I can remember jumping up and down for the entire song. And I look back and I think, how on earth did I jump up and down for three or four whole minutes? <laughs> <laughs> certainly couldn't do that now. Adrenaline. It was 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's you fantastic. Could, you could still do it. No, I, yeah. not for the whole song. No, oh, not the whole I don't song. think I could. <laughs> <laughs> but I think once I started, I, I was like, I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep going for the whole song. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's just some great lyrics in it. Take a ride on my 12 cylinder symphony. Love that. Yeah. Uh, Come down from the ceiling. I didn't mean to get so high. I couldn't do what I wanted to do when my lips were dry. You can't just up and leave me. I'm a singer in a band. Well, I like drummers, baby. You're not my bag. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Lucy... Maybe I'm naive, but explain the 12 cylinder symphony for me, please. I think it's basically, how do I put it politely? <laughs> a, a sexual yes, innuendo yeah. reference, you think? I'd say. Maybe. Yeah. Take a that, ride on my 12 cylinder symphony. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's how I imagine it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it went to in Lucy's mind. <laughs> I see. <laughs> well, he did say he wanted to write lots of dirty things. Yeah. So I think that's like an innuendo, basically. Okay. Uh, obviously, you know, I couldn't do what I wanted to do when my lips were dry. That's right. rude. Yes. <laughs> but um, you like that lyric. Yes, I do. And the rap in it as well is just 
epic. Whenever I try and think of Robbie's age, just immediately, born 74, comes into right. my head from that song and I can immediately work out how old he is because it's just embedded into my brain. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, ain't no chance the record company dropping me. It's another good line. Yeah. I just love it. Love the love, love. I thought you were going to read out the whole rap. Well, I no, won't do the, whole rap. do the whole rap. I could. I could actually sit and do the whole rap off the top of my head, but I won't. Because <laughs> I can't rap. What do you think? Do you love this one? I love it. Good. <laughs> you know I love it. I mean, yeah, just Carly and Robbie together, it works. And I mean, his vocal, he sings so high in this as well, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, jump on board. I mean, it just... Jump on board, take a ride, yeah. Uh, jump on board, feel the high, because the kids are all right. Um, I love the honorary Sean Connery line. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been, been looking for serial monogamy. monogamy. Not some bird that looks like Billy Connolly. I mean, <laughs> but now Do you I'm know down who Billy for Connolly all the apology. <laughs> That's an excellent question, Lucy. Off the top of my head, I do not know who Billy Connolly is, but I have looked him up and I know that I have seen him in certain films. Yeah. Yes. But he is not a household name in the U.S. No, no. <laughs> but I've seen him in Indecent Proposal, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, and The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. Ah. Yeah. But you certainly don't want your bird looking like... Billy Connolly, don't you? <laughs> do you? <laughs> well, no offense to Billy Connolly, no, but, but I do. Yeah, I think it, 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 it. It's just again one of those random uh, references. I mean, Billy Connolly is very, very famous here. Very famous comedian and actor, and uh, yeah, it, I guess, I guess it rhymes with the ornithology as well. You know, we have noticed that sometimes um, he lyrics, just sticks names in <laughs> go there. in there because they rhyme with certain things, but it, it works. I just think it's really funny. The fact that he's talking about ornithology and song, you know, come, grab your binoculars, come and follow me. <laughs> but obviously, there's a bird reference there as well yeah. in terms of you know we're out looking for birds. Um, yeah. As in, not the feathered kind. <laughs> and even I understand that as an American. You've got that. <laughs> Where we don't say birds. No. With that sense. Yeah. No. It's very clever. What do you reckon, Paul? Uh, this is a fun song with an infectious chorus. I love the beat and the percussion that makes that beat. Uh, I would definitely listen to this song a lot. The first yeah. year when I got Sing When You're Winning. Musically, it's just infectious and fun. The expression, you're not my bag, that's... Not an expression I have heard much. It may be British. In America, we would say something like, that's not my cup of tea, even <laughs> though many more Americans are coffee drinkers. But some say not my bag might mean not my bag of tea. Is that uh, how you understand it? I don't know. We just say not my bag. I don't really know if it's got an extension. It could come it. from that. I yeah. don't know. I mean, normally these things have deep roots in, in yeah. language somewhere, don't they? Um, Never really thought about it. Yeah. A year earlier, Kylie Minogue had worked with Pet Shop Boys on their album Nightlife for a song called In Denial. So here is another strong Pet Shop Boys connection with Robbie Williams yeah. that I'm starting to notice in the year 2000. Oh, he works with the same people. And I enjoy Kylie very much on the track. I know that The Kids Are All Right is the title of a documentary film of The Who from 1979, but I was wondering, does the expression doing it for the kids have a special meaning in British English? Well, sometimes you say, like, charity-wise, like, I'm doing it for the kids, like... Yeah. Like... Yeah, it is As in, thing. I'm a, you know, helping charity... You say, I'm doing it for the kids. Yeah, if you're doing voluntary work or something, you might hear someone say, yeah, I'm doing it for the kids, you know. And yeah. some people say it kind of seriously and then some people say it sort of tongue-in-cheek style. Yeah. It is a saying, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. In America, we'd say we're doing it for Jerry's kids. Oh, what does that mean? Jerry Lewis was a an actor and famously hosted a telethon for muscular dystrophy for years in the United right. States. Oh, Interesting. Ah, so there's a link on the yeah it's different different cultural reference but similar similar saying. 
Hi, I'm Robbie Williams, and you're listening to Robbie Williams Rewind with the Champions. So Kids was nominated for Best Video at the 2002 Brits. It was directed by Simon Hilton, who also did Strong, and it's based on the timeless piece from Greece with Travolta and Olivia Newton-John, or a 1940s, 1950s classic musical with Gene Kelly or Fred Astaire. The team had been working out how to use the Travelator and Rob got on and mastered how to dance and use it immediately while Kylie was on a raised platform to bring them face-to-face height-wise so she could lead him on and he would dance around her. I noticed that when we were watching it the other day. I was thinking, how? He doesn't look very very much taller than than her. Because Kylie is my height, as I always like to tell everyone when they laugh at my height. Well, okay. Kylie's my height. You don't laugh at her, do you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good retort, actually, Lucy. It works. Yes. People don't know what to say to that. No. <laughs> I think they're in another bullseye, another target. They're in the dead center of a black bullseye with a white circle around it in the video. I think they are at the beginning, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 They obviously like that style, that stylistic Paul has picked look. up on a definite common theme here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Rob said, I wasn't confident to hit on Kylie. I'd drunk a bottle of Drambuie, was smashed and found myself in the pool. And then Kylie comes into shot. She drops her negligee and she's naked and I didn't know what to do. And I just pointed and laughed at her like an idiot. And I think that's what spoiled it. (laughs) Yeah. He apologised for laughing in his You Know Me book in 2010, but says he's been too embarrassed to ever bring it up with her. And actually, you can see this moment on a YouTube video. If you ever want to watch it, it's called Robbie Williams Kids Getting Dizzy with the 360 camera or 360 degrees camera. So if you ever want to look at that. And this video also shows the moment when Rob and Kylie actually did kiss at the end, but they cut it in the final video. So it looks as though they stop before they kiss. But actually, they did kiss. And you can actually watch that in that video. That's fascinating because I did wonder. Yeah, because it looks like they are going to. But the way it cuts, you think, oh, well, they didn't really. But no, they actually did. (laughs) But I don't understand why Kylie had to be naked. I know. Well, apparently (laughs) Rob said that he hadn't been told that that was what was going to happen. And so I think she was only naked on the top half. Okay. Um, And so I think they wanted a genuine reaction from him. But unfortunately, I don't think it was the reaction they just <laughs> that they wanted. <laughs> Nervous laughter took over and, oh dear. I will say this, in the video, in the pool, yes. yeah. they did capture something with Robbie because he is looking particularly sexy at yes. the end of that video. And he has a facial expression that yeah. is just astoundingly sexy. Yes. Well, I think they must have obviously had to reshoot it. And that well, he got when, it right that time. Yeah, he definitely got it right that time. He knew what he was doing. Yes. I definitely feel the vibe from the movie Grease. Uh, there's a part where Kylie puts her hand on Rob's shoulder and walks toward him as Rob backs up. That's and right. And Olivia Newton-John does the same move with John Travolta. Yeah. And their black outfits and Kylie's tight spandex pants recall yeah. the outfits from Grease. Uh, at any rate, I would later find out that Grease is one of Rob's favorite movies. Yeah. Yes, I bet he loved it. And in the song Eyes on the Highway from 2017, he makes a very direct reference to John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. And when he sang Olivia Newton-John's name in a song, this is one of those moments where we connect with the material. I was floored because Olivia Newton-John is one of my absolute favorite singers. So there is Robbie Williams singing the name Olivia Newton-John. Wow. (laughs) Wow. And in an internet chat, I would often bring up Grease. But once I asked Rob about my absolute favorite movie of Olivia Newton-John's, I asked him what he thought of the movie Xanadu. And he responded, not my bag. Though I love the song, he said. So there's another instance of not my bag. (laughs) (laughs) But I can just imagine Ida and Teddy loving the movie Xanadu. And I wish they would share it with Rob because I'm not sure whether he's seen it all the way through. I've never seen it. No, I don't think I have. No. Lucy, you do have to see Xanadu. It's a fun movie. (laughs) We will. Yeah, we should. Apparently at the end of the video shoot from kids, 
uh, Jerry Halliwell had made a dash through London out to the countryside where it was being filmed to whisk Robbie away in her Aston Martin. So clearly she was like, I'm not having Rob spending the night uh. with Kylie. I'm going to make sure that he, <laughs> that I rescue him away from her. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, she was in control on that day then. Yeah. You're getting in my Aston Martin and <laughs> we're leaving Carly behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they both look incredible in that video, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the champagne cork popping <laughs> at the end. It's oh very my. suggestive. <laughs> A bit like the volcano we talked about earlier on. Was it yes, volcano? that's another <laughs> instance, yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, one of my, I think, second con third take that concert i ever went to in july 93 i was right by the side of the stage um in my seat so i think there's maybe one or two rows in front or maybe i was right next to it but anyway backstage so at the side of the stage right below me a few meters down was kylie watching take that in july 93 and at that point it was the closest i'd ever been to kylie and so i certainly know that she was a obviously a fan yeah even back then that is so interesting yeah so obviously the rest of the crowd couldn't see but i could because of where we were sat yeah we were like behind the curtain sort of thing yeah that was cool. a good moment I, I just i just remember carly's lips at the beginning <laughs> I mean, oh yeah so it's of that video i when i really like carly i think she is a an extremely good looking woman and still is um but that was just like very sensual indeed, you know, the the way that that opens the, the the whole video. And then, yeah, they've just got such chemistry in this video. It, it, you can feel it. It's palpable. I mean, it, it, um, I don't know. I <laughs> probably shouldn't say this, but it kind of feels as though it's a little bit beyond acting, maybe. I mean, they're both great actors, um, but you can tell that they're actually really enjoying it. Yeah. You know, um, there is a look of joy on their faces as they're doing it. And I don't think that is put on, you know, they're genuinely having fun. Yeah, and, I'd say. Um, and obviously I also remember um, images of lots of ladies climbing around the bars and the poles behind them as well. Um, just great interaction in the video. Um, loads of different dance routines going on. Yeah. That's one thing I noticed when I was watching it again, lots of dancers. Um, Glitter, mirror, mirror ball, mirrors everywhere, um, and then uh, yeah, that that bit at the end that we've already talked about is extremely erotic, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, good on Kylie for for going for it. And, yeah, know. I would like to know when we're ever going to hear the Robbie and Kylie second duet of Disco Symphony that they've recorded oh, yes. together. Hopefully one day. He's teased us enough with it on Instagram Live. We've heard the song on the Boy in the Dress soundtrack. Yeah. Now we want to hear the actual Kylie and Robbie version, please. That's my request. I put it out into the ether. <laughs> there you go, Rob. Let's <laughs> let's hear it. Could be a good one for the 25th year anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> There's be a lot happening next year. Um, and unfortunately, Robbie and Kylie haven't performed that song together very much, no. which is sad. They've done it on like, Top of the Pops and in Robbie's concert in 2000. I think, I can't really think of any, really many other instances. And yeah. Lucy, were you there when they performed live together? No, no. That was in Manchester, Manchester and I saw it in yeah. London. You would have loved to have seen that, wouldn't oh you? Oh my God, I would have done. That would have and been And there's historic. a guy's face in the audience when she comes on <laughs> and his face is what my face would have been like oh. had I been there. He was so excited. It was just written all over his face. That is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I wish you could have been there for that. Yeah. So, Maybe one uh, Myself, I would love to see Gary Barlow and Robbie Williams sing Shame together. And same. I've never seen that. Yeah, yeah we haven't because right. we weren't there that night. You were there the same night as us at the O2. Yeah. So we all right. missed out on that, didn't we? We had Guy, didn't we? No offense to Guy, but I would have rather had Gary. <laughs> Sorry, Guy. <laughs> As part of our research for this, though, we did, Lucy did put on Top of the Pops, you know, Top of the Pops, the program. Um, and yeah. 
they were on it and they were on at the end and they were singing live. They weren't miming because I guess it was in the days when most people sang live on the show. Yeah. And they were doing really, you know, f- essentially erotic sort of performance on the stage, really close to each other. And then they went down the floor, didn't they, at the end? Yeah. <laughs> and then the closing credits cut uh, the, the cut across the end of the video. So and Lucy was like, it. ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's like, well, what did they do that for? You know, it did. It, it was like, hang on a minute. We've just watched all these bands, like all this, all these replays of bands from that sort of era. And then you decide to cut the end of the song off. Yeah, it was gutted. <laughs> yes. So just before we wrap up this episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out. And also, Lucy and I would really appreciate it if you can leave us a star rating. You can do this on both Apple and Spotify podcasts. We would also love it if you could write us a short review. and You can do this on Apple. Don't forget, you can check out our episode notes for each episode and links to all tracks and videos at robbywilliamsrewind.com. You can also email us at email at robbywilliamsrewind.com. Please also follow and chat on our social channels. It's at Rewind Robbie on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. And you can also like and follow our Facebook page, Robbie Williams Rewind. And before we return to this episode, you might also consider sending us one of your own Robbie stories for the show. Just record a short audio clip on your phone and email it to us. Please check the website for more details. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robbie Williams, and you're listening to Robbie Williams Rewind with the Champions. So we are having such a great time with American Paul here, such incredible stories and commentary. And it's because it's so incredible that we've decided to split this episode into two parts. But don't worry, you don't have to wait two weeks. We'll be releasing part two next Wednesday. Tune in next week for more. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again, Paul. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Robbie Williams Rewind.